eye chain nephropathy is the most common primary glomerular disease in the world. It's identified usually by happenstance that patients are in a clinic and they're found to have some blood and protein in a urine test. And then it might also have high blood pressure and slightly abnormal kidney function. And then the patient generally gets referred to a kidney specialist and ultimately can only be diagnosed by kidney biopsy. The hazards are that it's increasingly recognized that this diagnosis uh, almost invariably leads to kidney failure in people's lifetimes. It progresses relatively slowly over 10 to 20 years, um, but most people with the disease um, are at very high risk of losing their kidney function and ultimately needing dialysis or kidney transplantation. Uh, the big challenges are, as I already suggested, trying to identify patients early. In other parts of the world, such as in Japan, there's a higher prevalence of the disease, and they routinely test every child and every adult's urine every year to see if they've got subtle changes and further evaluate them, and we don't do that in the United States. So one challenge is to try to identify patients early when the disease is most likely to be treated successfully. Um, and then uh, we only recently better understood the natural history of the disease and got more buy-in from nephrologists to understand it's a serious disease and needs attention and needs therapy. And finally, one of the limitations is that our therapies have not been highly effective. We treat the disease like all other chronic kidney disease in trying to get a good diet and exercise, good blood pressure control, and trying to use medications which um, interfere with angiotensin II in terms of limiting proteinuria and slowing progression. And we really haven't had disease-specific interventions. Uh, this was made more complicated by the fact that we do recognize that there is inflammation in the kidney and that there's immune activation. And we've used general immunosuppressants over the last 30, even 40 years with very variable degrees of success and invariable side effects and risks of complications from the immunosuppression. So this therapy called nefacon, which is a targeted form of budesonide, was sort of dreamed up about a, a decade ago as an opportunity to try to reduce the increased IgA that is seen in patients at risk and who develop IgA nephropathy, because we know that IgA is an antibody that really is there to protect our mucosal surfaces and our largest at-risk mucosal surface is our bowels and largest production center of immunoglobulin A is in the um, terminal ileum uh, and early, well, in the terminal ileum where we have Peyer's patches. So the idea was to sort of target that area specifically with a corticosteroid, which in turn um, does not get absorbed into the body well, or in the case of budesonide, it gets absorbed but it gets very strongly degraded by the liver um, upon absorption so that the systemic side effects of steroids should be very limited, but the local effect on the bowel should be to suppress IgA production. And in IgA nephropathy, it's a galactose deficient form of IgA that is associated with the disease and subsequent development of, of anti-IgA antibodies, which form immune complexes, which then can deposit in the kidney and initiate the kidney inflammation and injury. So the, the drug was designed to work in the bowel to reduce IgA production with the hopes that that would ultimately stop the inflammation in the kidney.
after a, a very um, well-sized phase two study was completed and showed an ability to reduce proteinuria in IgA nephropathy, which is a cardinal sign of the risk for kidney function loss. And in that phase two study also showed a stabilization of kidney function over the nine months of treatment with um, Neficon. The phase three study was launched globally to try to get a good mixture of patients with various um, severities of IJ nephropathy, with um, all with high risk of progression, defined by reduced kidney function between 30 and 90 mils per minute, um, with high risk also defined as more than a gram per day of urinary protein losses. And then patients were treated for nine months um, with the Sneficon, which is an oral therapy, on top of their best um, optimized conservative care, which is their maximally tolerated use of either angiotensin II receptor blockers or ACE inhibitors. And the study was then designed to follow the patients for an additional 15 months after the drug was stopped to see if there was lasting effects on proteinuria and on kidney function as well. And uh, again, as is reported, you know, more than 350 patients participated in the study. These were very typical, well-representative population of IJ nephropathy patients with reduced kidney function, significant proteinuria, um, averaging more than two grams per day, a representative of Europe, the US, and Asia, men and women. And the drug was successful within nine months of reducing proteinuria by about 30% by one year, even after the drug was stopped for three months, proteinuria on average was down about 50% from baseline. And this resulted in seeing a stabilization of kidney function through the nine months, such that there was really no change in kidney function, and then slower progression over those remaining 15 months, so that at the end of two years, there was a, a really substantial clinically important reduction in kidney disease progression, where it was about half the rate as those patients who were treated with placebo in the study. So the safety of the medication looked to be very um, well tolerated with very few safety issues. There were some signs, again, of steroid exposure, as one might expect with low-dose chronic steroid exposure in the nine months of treatment. Uh, this resolved in the patients after the drug was, was removed, but patients continued having, through the two years of observation, significantly reduced proteinuria and significantly stabilized kidney function. And again, as you suggested, this led the FDA to review the data, both in terms of early approval at the nine-month time point where, again, there was evidence of clinically important reductions in proteinuria in a well-tolerated fashion. And now, um, with the two-year data, the FDA was, again, able to give full approval for patients at risk of progression with IG nephropathy. And we now have this um, available in our clinics for patients with IG nephropathy. Again, we now have uh, an available medication that's really targeted specifically for IgA nephropathy. It gets to the real mechanism of the disease. So we think it's truly disease modifying. There's additional evidence now that it also can reduce hematuria, that it does indeed reduce the galactose deficient IgA in patients. And therefore, we really now, for the first time, have a well-tolerated, safe medication that can really change the natural history of this disease and benefit our patients. Um, and so it really is the very, very attractive alternate to systemic immunosuppression, and again, a, a much better choice than no therapy for the vast majority of our patients.